Hey, Cypher here. It's been a decade since I fought in the war in Afghanistan, and a decade before that the war began. Yet somehow, we're still fighting there. A few years ago, I made an episode about how this could be considered America's longest war, depending on your definition. And perhaps we're finally seeing the end of it. But the beginning is so far away that I think we need to re-examine what caused it. And here's the answer. 9-11. Did I get anybody with that? Like, seriously, I've done that like four times and people still comment about them because they somehow lack the attention span for such a serious topic as the causes of warfare. They can't sit through an extra few minutes to grasp their nuances to every single one. Well, Afghanistan and the rest of the global war on terror is no different. The history of international terrorism is fraught with weird turns and will take us all over the Muslim world. By the way, Afghanistan is not the Middle East. It's Central or Southern Asia, hence why I say Muslim world. Joining me to talk about this is Hikma History, who's doing his own episode on the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, so be sure to check that out. The U.S. made many enemies throughout the region by intervening and allying in different ways that pissed off locals, some of whom resorted to terrorism. While the immediate cause of the global war on terror is 9-11, digging deeper into the history yields a cause of the war that most Americans don't care to grapple with. We've bumbled through our international relations and have created enemies, whether justly or unjustly. You'll often hear people saying stuff like, Bro, we like helped Iraq in the 1980s and supported the Mujahideen. What did you expect? Plus, it's all just a conspiracy to grab oil, duh. And even worse than that, you'll often hear people saying, well, like, it's a clash of civilizations. Like, there's freaking Muslims versus Christians. That's just how it is. All of these are wrong and kind of relying on conspiracy theories, especially the last one, which is actually relying on the same conspiracy theory that Osama bin Laden relied on to propagate his message and cause 9-11. So let's think for once and look at where this problem actually began. And you might be surprised, but we can pretty much root it in the Camp David Accords. Before we get started, I'd like to thank my patrons for making this possible. Talking about terrorism is actually one of the things listed as being too sensitive according to YouTube, so this is demonetized. As Mobius Eagle said on Twitter, never forget unless you want to monetize. And despite this falling directly within an exception drawn by YouTube, they will never acknowledge that they violate their own guidelines. Heck, this is likely to be age-restricted too, if past episodes are any indicator. Only a large corporation gets to have the proclaimed rules applied to them correctly. This is hypocritical and cowardly of Team YouTube, but unfortunately all too common, revealing an inability to support educational content on this platform. Luckily I have support from viewers like you that allows me to weather such suppression of educational content. I also have merchandise that you can buy if you would like to support the channel in a different way. Thanks to everyone who does that, and on with the show. The Israeli-Palestine conflict is fundamental to the rise of international terrorism. Much of the Muslim world feels deeply wronged by the creation of Israel. After World War II, Britain, who still held power over Palestine, fought two insurgencies. Jewish immigrants, known as Zionists, wanted autonomous territory in Palestine, and some resorted to terrorism and guerrilla warfare in order to achieve it, while many Muslims formed their own militias to fight the Jewish insurgency. The horrors of the Holocaust brought many Jews to Palestine, along with worldwide sympathy for their plight. Plus, many Jews in Eastern Europe faced pogroms after the war, and many were fiercely anti-communist. So they left for Palestine all the same, 
making for a mass influx of Jewish population in the late 1940s. It was such a problem that Britain asked the United Nations General Assembly to figure out what to do with the state on the brink of civil war in 1947. They decided to partition it in two, one part Palestine and the other Israel. Partitioning to solve ethnic problems was perfectly fine with Britain, considering they had done so with absolutely no problems between India and Pakistan. Well, sure enough, a civil war broke out immediately. As soon as Israel declared her independence and Britain conceded to it in 1948, the newly formed Arab League intervened. Despite Israeli forces being completely made out of independent militias, they quickly formed the Israel Defense Force and defeated the interventionists, leading to an armistice agreement in which the Arab League at least acknowledged the borders of Israel at the time, known as the Green Line. Britain, France, and the United States declared themselves in favor of keeping this line, and no one has ever had a problem with that, except basically the rest of the world, including the Soviet Union. The Arab League and Soviets were basically allies, making NATO back Israel, which is a Cold War legacy that continues to the present. Though fighting over Israeli boundaries and control continued, what I'm concerned about in this episode is the rise of international terrorism. In 1964, the Palestine Liberation Organization, or PLO, was formed. Though terrorism long predates that, extremists affiliated with the PLO went international with airplane hijackings and kidnappings in foreign countries to raise awareness. After the 1967 Six-Day War, Israel occupied a lot of Arab lands, including the Sinai Peninsula, the West Bank, and Golan Heights, which they continued to occupy. A break-off of the PLO, called Black September, really made the news when they massacred 11 Israelis and a German police officer during the Munich Olympics in 1972. Muslim terrorism was now a worldwide threat, and the U.S. became deeply involved with Israel as a result. Another short war began when Egypt surprise attacked Israel on Yom Kippur. This time the U.S. aided Israel because the Soviets were supporting the Arab League. Yet again, Israel defeated the League. Only in 1978 with the Camp David Accords did the Arab League's alliance against Israel finally break up, because Egypt formally recognized Israel in return for the Sinai. This was the breaking point for Islamic extremists, who considered the resulting Israel-Egyptian treaty a betrayal of their religion. 39th President Jimmy Carter. Oh, come on! Beach history's greatest monster! They saw it as capitulating to Jews so they could control the Holy Land. Just in time for that, two events swept the Muslim world in 1979. First in Iran, Islamic leftists started making headway in the country against the U.S.-backed Shah. A year prior, they burnt down Rex Cinema, killing more than 420 people. The Shah's crackdown on peaceful protests in response was terrible, resulting in a revolution. The new government invited the long-exiled Ayatollah Khomeini in 1979, who quickly turned the revolution toward religious fundamentalism using anti-Zionist rhetoric to sway the masses. Iran became a major donor of weapons, money, and militants to the PLO and Hezbollah, who expanded their terror attacks worldwide. That same year, the Soviets intervened in a civil war between communists and republicans in Afghanistan. Let's see what Hikma history has to say about the cause of the Soviet invasion. In 1973, the former Prime Minister Dawood came to power in a bloodless coup that overthrew Afghanistan's long-standing monarchy. The republic that was established had several communist members of the PDPA or the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan in important positions. When the strongman President Dawood decided to move against the Soviet-backed PDPA, the Afghan communists rose up and violently overthrew the republic during the Sawar coup of April 1978. Over the course of the next 18 months or so, the Afghan communist government lost more and more legitimacy in the eyes of its citizens as it tried to impose Marxist policies on a staunchly Muslim nation. The rising tide of anti-communist sentiment in Afghan society, as well as internal divisions within the PDPA, fueled the Soviet Union to finally decide to intervene in the country in December 1979. 
Yeah, it's that convoluted, which is why Hikma History is doing a breakdown on his channel about that. He's from Afghanistan, so go check that out. Anyways, that only increased the instability in the country. It was especially pronounced due to the official atheism of the Soviets. So a group of Afghans fought against them, called the Mujahideen, which simply means jihadist warriors. Neighboring Pakistan aided the Mujahideen from the south, and the United States sent secret funding and material through them. It was a full-on proxy war, and over 20,000 foreign fighters joined in the jihad, one of which was a no-name upstart from Saudi Arabia named Osam bin Laden. He was there as a financier than as an actual fighter. Now, the U.S.'s Central Intelligence Agency claims they only aided local Mujahideen rather than these foreigners. But since it was being funneled through Pakistan, they really had no control over it. That war drew many jihadists throughout the 1980s, but international terror continued anyways. Lebanon was in a civil war. Because of their proximity and involvement with Israel, it became a focal point. The U.S. had intervened during the 1958 crisis there and remained a supporter of the Lebanese government once the civil war broke out in 1975. After seven years of constant turmoil, America brokered a peace between Israel and the PLO, who were belligerents in the Lebanese war. So a coalition force tried to keep the peace for a few years. In 1983, a local terrorist organization suicide bombed the U.S. embassy, killing 63 then escalated to bombing a U.S. Marine barracks in Beirut, killing another 307. This was huge news worldwide, and really illustrated what terrorism could achieve, since Reagan backed down from Lebanon after that. He'd soon be embroiled in a scandal of funding Contras in Nicaragua by providing arms to Iran through Hezbollah, who actively supported jihadist organizations, including those who had perpetrated the Lebanese bombings. Lebanon was a huge victory for Islamic terrorists, who increasingly targeted the U.S. for her alliance with Israel. Jihadism was not only a response to Israel, but the failure of Arab nationalist movements, like the Arab League, to remove the Jewish state from Palestine. The Camp David Accords had set in motion much of this, and one side of those accords became the nexus of jihadism. Since 1928, the Muslim Brotherhood fought Western influence and felt betrayed by Anwar Sadat's making peace with Israel. They assassinated him for it in 1981. His successor, Hosni Mubarak, tried to crack down on the Brotherhood, splintering it into numerous organizations. These splinter groups became increasingly radicalized, often resorting to ideas of an old Brotherhood member who'd been executed for conspiracy in 1966. Saeed Qutb wrote about how terrorism was the tool for Islamic revolution, and this was a perfect ideology for jihadists in the wake of Lebanon. This was an even more fundamentalist interpretation of Wahhabism, which believed in forced conversion to Islam and the implementation of ultra-conservative Sharia law. Egypt became a focal point of jihadism culminating in the 1997 Luxor massacre, which killed 62 tourists. Back in Afghanistan, the Soviet Union finally withdrew in the late 1980s. It left a power vacuum that turned into a civil war among former Mujahideen. The country was basically ruled by warlords, and foreign fighters often splintered off to form their own organizations, including a group called Al-Qaeda in 1988. By then, Osama bin Laden was the leader, but he went home to Saudi Arabia for a few years after the Soviet withdrawal. In 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait, intent on either annexing it, or at least a couple of their islands, causing a massive oil price shock. In the 1980s, the U.S. had supported Iraq against Iran with war material and funding, but their president, Saddam Hussein, used chemical weapons against northern Kurds and Assyrians as part of his Arabization campaign in 1988. This immediately ended relations with Saddam, who was now seen as a genocidal maniac. So when he invaded Kuwait, there was already much bad blood. He then tried to link it to the Israel-Palestine conflict by saying if they withdrew from the Golan Heights and the West Bank, that he'd withdraw from Kuwait. But the world was not having any of it. Both the UN and Arab League authorized use of force to remove Saddam from Kuwait. Bin Laden actually offered his tiny band of miscreants, but the Saud family went with an international coalition led by the U.S. America had a vested interest in keeping the region balanced, because with this invasion, Saddam had control of 20% of the world's oil reserves. 
So to establish this balance, the Coalition forces swiftly invaded Kuwait and sent Iraqi forces packing in only 100 hours. Though Kuwait was liberated, this campaign would have lasting effects. The US supported anti-Saddam uprisings in Iraq and even imposed an indefinite no-fly zone over the region most affected by those uprisings, including some minor interventions during the Clinton administration. The US remained poised to topple Saddam, but avoided doing so for a decade. But more pressing to our story is how Osama bin Laden felt wronged by Saudi Arabia because of the Persian Gulf War. He thought that allowing American infidels on Arab land was sacrilege, and honestly believed he could have defeated Saddam's army with his ragtag group of terrorists, despite being outnumbered and outgunned by several orders of magnitude. Bin Laden wasn't exactly right in the head, especially since he thought the US was engaging in a war against Islam itself. This conspiracy theory was fundamental to Al-Qaeda. To them, everything the US did in the Middle East was to eradicate Islam altogether, despite the fact that bin Laden himself had seen firsthand US efforts to support Mujahideen in Afghanistan. Conspiracism requires denial of evidence, after all, and Al-Qaeda was now firmly targeting the US because of this. The US government has committed acts that are extremely unjust, hideous, and criminal through its support of the Israeli occupation of Palestine and we believe the U.S. is directly responsible for those killed in Palestine, Lebanon, and Iraq. Due to its subordination to the Jews, the arrogance of the United States regime has reached the point that they occupied Arabia, the holiest place of the Muslims, who are more than a billion people in the world today. For this and other acts of aggression and injustice, we have declared jihad against the U.S. Miffed by Saudi support of American intervention, bin Laden relocated to Sudan in 1992 and immediately started a terror campaign worldwide, with the first happening at a hotel in Yemen that same year. An unofficially affiliated bombing killed six a year later by bombing the World Trade Center. But President Clinton was more concerned with Iraq than this growing threat, at least until the 1998 bombing of the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi, which killed 224 people. This landed Osama bin Laden on the number one spot for the FBI's most wanted list for the next 13 years. Before that, he had relocated from Sudan. Egypt cracked down on jihadists after an assassination attempt in 1995. A group called Egyptian Islamic Jihad arrived in Sudan following this crackdown. These were the same folks who assassinated Anwar Sadat in 1981, and because of their misdeeds upon arrival, Sudan joined with Egypt to crack down on jihadists, partially trying to appease U.S. sanctions on Sudan. So bin Laden turned back to Afghanistan. The country was still in the midst of a civil war between former Mujahideen, but one new faction had taken the majority of territory. Taliban in Pashto simply means students, because a former Mujahideen fighter named Muhammad Omar, who was a local mullah, brought together seminary students to fight the rampant lawlessness in Kandahar. The Taliban became increasingly fundamentalist as they conquered more and more of Afghanistan, committing numerous atrocities to solidify their power. In 1996, when bin Laden was on the run from Egyptian and Saudi power, he made an alliance with the Taliban to use al-Qaeda as their elite troops in the fight for control of Afghanistan, even bringing in other jihadist organizations from Egypt to merge under the black banner of al-Qaeda. This was essentially a safe haven for Osama bin Laden, where he could continue to conspiracy theorize about the US's supposed war on Islam, and therefore he planned more terror attacks to be carried out through the Al-Qaeda network. By 2001, this alliance between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda bore enough fruit that there remained only one other major power in the country, who were actually often warring amongst themselves. Since they only held northern Afghanistan, they're called the Northern Alliance, made up of former Mujahideen themselves, and that year would cause a number of turning points in the Afghan Civil War. The U.S. was already aiding the Northern Alliance after the 1998 Nairobi attacks, and they intensified by the 2000 attack on the USS Cole. The CIA even had a couple of times that they could have taken out Osama bin Laden, but President Clinton chose not to because of diplomatic issues. Much of this aid went to former Mujahideen, under a man who earned the nickname the Lion of Panjshir. 
Ahmad Shah Massoud seemed to be making headway against the Taliban in mid-2001, but Al-Qaeda managed to assassinate him. It would have been a decisive blow against the Northern Alliance if Al-Qaeda didn't make a decisive blow against the United States less than 48 hours later. Al-Qaeda was steadily ramping up their attacks, and their most audacious plan was set for September 11th, 2001. 19 hijackers took control of four airplanes that morning. Plane hijackings weren't unknown at the time, but normally were used by terrorists for ransom. But that's not what Osama bin Laden planned. The first plane crashed into one of the Twin Towers in New York City. The next hit the other tower. A third crashed into the Pentagon. The final one, United Airlines Flight 93, was delayed long enough that passengers were informed from the ground of the other attacks, so they overpowered the hijackers and crashed into rural Pennsylvania. With the whole world glued to their television screens, they watched as the towers burned. Police and firefighters rushed in to rescue whomever they could and evacuate the buildings, but they were out of time. Two hours passed and both towers collapsed. Almost 3,000 Americans died that day. Turning the lumbering giant of American foreign policy around would normally take months, but Congress moved faster than the President. They passed the Use of Military Force Act only a week later. Two days after that, President Bush issued an ultimatum to the Taliban saying, This group and its leader, a person named Osama bin Laden, are linked to many other organizations in different countries including the Egyptian Islamic Jihad and the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan. There are thousands of these terrorists in more than 60 countries. By aiding and abetting murder, the Taliban regime is committing murder. And tonight, the United States of America makes the following demands on the Taliban. Deliver to United States authorities all the leaders of Al-Qaeda who hide in your land. Release all foreign nationals, including American citizens you have unjustly imprisoned. And protect foreign journalists, diplomats, and aid workers in your country. Close immediately and permanently every terrorist training camp in Afghanistan and hand over every terrorist and every person in their support structure to appropriate authorities. <laughs> Give the United States full access to terrorist training camps so we can make sure they are no longer operating. These demands are not open to negotiation or discussion. The Taliban must act and act immediately. They will hand over the terrorists or they will share in their fate. Our war on terror begins with Al-Qaeda, but it does not end there. It will not end until every terrorist group of global reach has been found, stopped, and defeated. Americans should not expect one battle, but a lengthy campaign, unlike any other we have ever seen. It may include dramatic strikes visible on TV and covert operations, secret even in success. We will starve terrorists of funding, turn them one against another, drive them from place to place until there is no refuge or no rest. And we will pursue nations that provide aid or safe haven to terrorism. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. From this day forward, any nation that continues to harbor or support terrorism will be regarded by the United States as a hostile regime. Even just a couple of weeks after 9-11, Bush had clearly delineated what the war on terror would represent. Al-Qaeda was merely the first target, but it was meant to fight international terrorism wherever it was rooted. 
There would be no negotiations with the Taliban, and the US expected absolute acquiescence to these demands, which of course the Taliban bristled at the idea. They gave in to one demand, and only one, offering bin Laden to an international court in Pakistan to be tried under Sharia law. Of course the US would not take such a weak accession. So war was on. The United Nations had already sanctioned Afghanistan because of their support of Al-Qaeda, and by claiming the right of self-defense under the UN Charter, NATO gathered to intervene in the Afghan Civil War on behalf of the Northern Alliance. At first this consisted of B-52s bombing targets throughout the country that merely looked like Taliban from the air. But in October, a group of special forces helped through guiding bombs. Throughout the rest of 2001, more American troops poured into Afghanistan, defeating the Taliban by early December. But insurgents remained. The coalition was reformed by the UN on December 20th, 2001, creating the International Security Assistance Force, or ISAF, turning coalition forces into a peacekeeping mission. The war has changed quite a bit over the last couple decades, but it still remains a peacekeeping mission. That mission was called Operation Enduring Freedom, and it went to other countries. There was OEF Philippines, and a few regions that even remain today, called OEF Horn of Africa, Operation Juniper Shield in Northwest Africa, and several other ones worldwide. These operations are much smaller efforts than Afghanistan, consisting mostly of special operations forces. In 2003, using supposed links to Al-Qaeda and the fear of weapons of mass destruction, the US invaded Iraq as well. This was called Operation Iraqi Freedom, as though it was part of the fight against Al-Qaeda. Its initial purpose was not to defeat terrorism, but to force Iraq's compliance with removing weapons of mass destruction, or WMDs. But after a year of the Bush administration fear-mongering about WMDs, none were to be found. Boy. Saddam Hussein had been making it difficult for UN inspectors, but clearly the US military was no better than UN inspectors. So the mission changed when terrorists shifted to Iraq, which that war didn't end until 2010, and reignited to fight ISIS in 2014. The Iraq war itself deserves its own episode on the causation, because it's kinda separate from the global war on terror. And it's truly a global war. Indiscriminate bombings in other countries and offshoot wars such as Yemen and the fight against ISIS continue today. The US has engaged in what it calls extraordinary rendition, or really international kidnapping and torture, massive electronic surveillance, and an internal security apparatus of immensely unconstitutional proportions, all in the name of preventing another 9-11. As with most wars, no one expected it to last as long as it has. But that's what happens when you take aim at an idea rather than people. I fought this war in 2009 to 2010, a year later, Navy SEALs killed Osama bin Laden. Tonight, I can report to the American people and to the world that the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al-Qaeda. ISAF handed off major operations to the Afghan army at the end of 2014, creating a support mission instead. Yet the Taliban and Al-Qaeda continue to exist and spread elsewhere. As I am writing this, there are 8,000 American troops in Afghanistan, with an additional 8,000 by the rest of the coalition. The war isn't over, but after two decades, it's time to see what caused it. Looking back, we can see the growth of international terrorism related to U.S. support of Israel. The U.S. was already meddling in the Muslim world, enough to cause jihadists to target us. Bin Laden's rampant conspiracism caused him to plan attacks against the U.S., and the Taliban gave him shelter so they could win the war against the Northern Alliance. 9-11 woke up the sleeping giant of the United States. It's obvious that the global war on terror was purely retaliatory, but the question for the future is if the retaliation has simply made the US more enemies we'll have to fight in the future. This war was brought on by making such enemies, well beyond our comprehension. No one would have thought that the Persian Gulf War would radicalize some random militia and their conspiracist leader. But lo and behold, that's precisely what we had in 2001. There are a lot of misconceptions about US support of Mujahideen and whatnot, but at no point was the US responsible for Osama bin Laden's rise or the Taliban, and in fact, was fighting against that influence by 1998. But the weird offshoot of conspiracism, wahadism, and katubism all combined in Osama bin Laden, 
who resorted to terrorism after the Persian Gulf War. How many more of these people are being made every day as we continue this war? Somebody's being annoying. Just, just a reminder, as King Richard I proclaims, bigots get banned. They're right. <laughs> King. A third crashed into the Pentagon. Hey, Safer here. It's... He's making this impossible. the one who chose to be in here, hmm? Before you all go, don't forget to check out Hikma History's video.